Hi everyone, welcome to our second lecture on holistic health. So as we have done previously, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wajak people, and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I respect their cultural beliefs and the spiritual relationship with their country and recognise that these are still important to the Wajak people today. So today we are looking at care routines and all of those functional elements within a childcare setting. So what we're thinking about is how it meets our requirements, the child's requirements, the parent requirements and so on. Now, care routines in early childhood settings, they are truly the cornerstone of what you are doing for each of your parts of your day. So in your unit, in your course outline, your assignment that you do is all focused around care routines. We need you to truly understand and be able to implement these immediately once you set foot in a childcare next term. So that's why we're getting you to really explore it, to make sure that you really understand each of those different care routines that you need to put in place. So... Your website must document research and practices regarding care routines for children in early childhood settings. And you've got a number of sections that you have to do this with. So you have to identify the major care routines and discuss the importance of them. You've got to be able to describe the qualities of the best practice in early childhood settings from birth to two years of age, because that's when we're doing all of those care routines that could potentially hurt children. It could potentially ensure that they are feeling safe and secure. So we need to make sure that we are putting them into practice in the best way possible. And then you've got to describe the qualities of best practice for care routines for the three to five year olds. Because remember the first part of your prac is in the baby room for those little zero to two year olds. And then the second part of your prac is in that three to five year old age bracket. And then your final part of your website that you have to do is you've got to reflect on the implications of that content for practices in early childhood settings. And you want to make reference to the importance of forming good partnerships with parents and the use of an integrated approach. Now, as usual, you need to make sure that you acknowledge all the work of anyone that you are using because a lot of these things you will be finding information from various sites and you'll be translating it and putting it into your own words and making sure that it meets all the needs and requirements. So you need to acknowledge any references. You need to use a minimum of eight different references and at least three of them must be books, book chapters or journal articles, not more than 10 years old. And each of those four sections must have reference support for ideas and information. So all you're going to do is submit an assignment cover sheet with your, actually you won't submit an assignment cover sheet. What you'll do is make sure that you have put your URL through Blackboard and I'll go through that with you in the tutorials. So what we know is that our care routines, they are where we establish that predictable environment. Now it means that we're, as the providers, we're establishing that attention and warmth and ways that we care and show care within our settings. So when we're looking at what we do in our routines, we want to make sure that we are considering every child's developmental level and individual needs. It's really important that we look at how much of our day we spend and how much it is important that we're looking at those body sensations, the needs of the child, looking at all those different routines such as napping and toilet training. Now, routines that we just consider to be part of the day, yes, they are, but it's also, they are the crucial elements of a child's day. Every one of those little routines, that's how the child knows what's going to be going on and what's happening next. So it's important that we don't rush them and that we view them as a really valuable learning experience. So let's have a think about what is important. So well-planned routines, they contribute to the emotional security and the success of children who are in care. So we're setting those kids up for the future. We're making sure that they feel safe and secure at all points in time. We're creating that 
optimal brain development and we're making sure that we understand babies in particular, they are 100% dependent on, an, on adults to take care of every one of their needs. They deserve and demand really, really loudly all of your attention. So make sure you take the time to really stop and enjoy that moment in a child's life, remembering that you are truly helping to wire their brains. So we know that children really thrive when they're in a well-ordered and consistent environment where daily routines such as our arrivals, our departures, their meal times, their nap times and their toileting, they're all dealt with really consistently by all caregivers. That's why your childcare centres will have these rules and routines. They'll have those posters. They'll make sure it is consistent regardless of the caregiver who is working in the room at that time. What we want to make sure is that all of the caregiving routines that you have, that they build that sense of security for a child. The child knows what's going to happen. They understand why you're talking to them all the way through. They've got that sense of safety and security about things, that sense of stability that they know what's going on. Now, we as the adults, we help them to develop that idea of what goes on in their day and how they can have some agency during the day. So we're developing that idea of self-discipline about things. Certain things happen at certain times. They know what's going on, when and why. We want to remain flexible and responsive, but we also have the needs of the child that we have to take into account, their bodily functions, their functions to take care of their safety and so on. So we want to make sure that we are providing those best essential needs. So we are meeting their essential needs in the way that we define as being best practice at that particular centre. Now, a CEQA has defined and put in guidelines and then every centre goes and refines those to meet the needs of their rooms, their locations, the uh, individuals who are working there, the number of children they have and so on. So we meet all the essential needs in the best way possible. And what we know is that by developing those good routines, it develops effective trust and secure attachments between all of the caregivers and the children that are in their care. So what we always have to consider though is what happens when the quality of care that a child's receiving is diminished in some way. So we have to think, what are we going to do to make sure that it is not diminished? So a word that we hear all the time is attachment. So when we provide the environments that help children feel safe, children learn they can trust others, they can take care of them, they'll meet their needs, they feel free to relax and explore their world and they're really ready to learn. So the way that we handle those routines is especially important for babies. Through the tasks such as, you know, your feeding, your nappy changing, we communicate to the child they can trust us, they can rely on us to nourish them and provide for their needs. And that special bond of trust is what we call attachment. So our child psychologists know and have many, many studies that assert that that trust and attachments that develop within the first two years essentially determine the emotional future of the child. And given that some of the children that you have in your care at the child care settings will be with you, yeah, sometimes for longer awake hours than they will be with their parents potentially. So you are really important in developing that attachment. So these are some of the tips that help children develop some bonding. So you want to practice listening and paying attention to what the child is telling you. You will learn to pick up on the different cries, on their different movements. Be sensitive to their cues. Pay attention to your own verbal cues and body language. So you'll see that you'll start to do the same things when it's coming time to a particular routine and the children will start clapping their arms. They'll get all excited when they know that it's food time or when it's nappy time and so on. You want to talk to the baby even though he or she may not be speaking to you, that constant dialogue is really important for the child to listen to, to understand the nuances of language, to develop all of the feelings of safety that you want them to have. Don't rush through, oh, 
they've dirtied their nappy, I have to go and quickly change it and then get on with the rest of my day. Nappy changing can be part of those beautiful times that you spend with the children. So don't rush through them just to get them finished. Obviously, if they're nice smelly ones, absolutely rush through it. But spend time then touching and um, talking and doing all the things that make the child feel safe. And you want to establish routines that are based around each individual baby's needs. And you'll soon get to know those little babies as individuals as you spend more and more time with them. So when we think about our care routines, what are the things that we're actually talking about? So these are all our daily routines. So how the children arrive into the centre and how you let them leave the centre. So making it not chaotic, making it very calm, thinking about how you can predict and prevent some issues to start with, trying not to have blocked up doorways and all those sorts of things, having nice handoffs, thinking about what it can look like. Thinking about your feeding and meal times, so making sure it's adaptive to the child's and the children's needs, as well as the centre, spreading out your time so you don't have groups of children waiting long periods of time before they get fed and so on. And thinking about what do your nap and rest times look like? Where are they? What is the centre doing? What is happening in the rest of the centre while there's nap times and rest time? How is it going to be handled in different spaces around the area and so on? You want to have everybody with a really familiar schedule so the children know what's going on. And then you've got your nappy changing and toileting, that transition from nappies into um, self-toileting. You want to work out your routines, all of those sorts of things. They're such an important part of the day. So let's go into them in a little bit more detail. So when we think about our arrivals and departures, you want to work with the parents and the caregivers to ensure that it's pleasant for everyone and that the children are able to settle in as quickly as possible without going through what we know is separation anxiety. So usually your babies will be okay and it's around that nine month old time where the children start to go through those really clingy parts where they will be crying and they'll be clinging onto mum and so on. So what we want to think about is what is our routine? How are we going to handle that? You don't want to wrench the child out of mum's arms, but you want to create a nice environment for the child to move into and so on. Sometimes you can't get past the separation anxiety and that's okay. Children, it is part of their development that they're going through. So how we handle separations at an early age sometimes does help them handle separations at a later age. So it can be quite life shaping. So we want to make sure we've got good ways of doing it. Now, those arrivals and departure times, they allow the children to really build that trust with their parents and transfer it over a little bit to the educators. But you have to be part of that. So it might be as simple as you have the same educator where possible greeting the same children. You work out what are your routines. You might have particular things that are set up in the room and that's what they always want to go to. You might have particular music that plays so the children associate that music with coming into the childcare centre and so on. So you want to always think about how you're going to build that in some way. So with our next one, it is our feeding. So, oh my goodness, feeding is going to be something that you go through constantly. It just seems that, yes, that's all they do. So, babies only need breast milk or formula for the first four to six months of life. Now, a little baby's tummy is very small, so they're not going to be having gigantic bottles. So you want to have small, frequent feedings. And that's what we talk about, is that that constant feeding that they will need for those first few months of their life. Now, we say they only need breast milk. They don't need any supplementary um, food or anything like that, particularly for the first four months of life. They can be exclusively breastfed or exclusively formula fed or a mixture of both. So in a childcare setting, you'll have some little infants who are on expressed best breast milk and they will be stored in different places and you'll have to follow all the rules and processes for that. You'll have some uh, babies that have formula and you'll have processes that are in the center for that as well. 
And then as they move through their feeding times, it'll increase with different types of food as they get to six months and start to move on to solids. They will still be having quite a lot of milk, but it will be supplemented with different types of solids. Now we know breast milk is ideal, but it's not always possible. So some babies don't attach properly. Some mothers have difficulty feeding. Sometimes the breast milk doesn't come in in enough uh, quantity for different babies who might be very hungry or some it sometimes it just doesn't work and sometimes it's beautiful and parents go through a little bit of a grief process when they do have to send their child to childcare because they're not going to be able to have all of the breastfeeding. Sometimes we find the transition from a breast to a bottle is quite tricky and some babies need to try out various types of bottles so that they can find one that they can actually use because there is a big difference between the way the milk lets down in a breast versus feeding from a bottle. So documenting is very important with the amount of food that a child drinks. We will record it in every way possible. And obviously you've got all of your standard safe handling practices that you have to go through your labeling, storage, and so on. You wanna make sure you're giving the right child the right formula, the right milk, because different children may be allergic to things. You've got all of those things and obviously standard hygiene practice such as hand washing and so on before and after and everything else that you have. So there's all of those things that you need to be aware of. Now, infant formulas in Australia in particular, they're manufactured so they are really similar to breast milk and they can be complete replacements for breast milk. So we have to be aware in Australia that our infant formulas are fantastic and that they do provide all the needs for our very young children. So please make sure you follow all of the processes that are outlined through a CEQA and in the individual centres guidelines for when we handle breast milk. And we'll talk more about those in the tutorials. So when we are feeding, that is such a beautiful time to nurture and develop that relationship with the babies. So babies, we know they learn through their senses. So when they're talked to, when they're held by their educators, this verbal and tactile stimulation, it contributes to the wiring of their brains and their neurological development. Holding, talking, smiling at the babies, it's how they learn. Now, who decides when a baby eats? So there is all these things on the internet about you should have the you know, feed by the clock, feed by the needs. So you decide when a baby eats, yes, but it's decided really and truly by the baby. So you will learn that hungry cry that comes from a child. It's actually heartbreaking. You will start to hear it when you're in shopping centers and so on. There's a different cry between a really hungry cry and a, I'm, I'm grizzly and I want some attention cry. So you'll see increased arm motions and leg motions. They'll kind of be grunting. They'll be fussing. They will be sucking really hard if they've got dummies and so on. So that franticness, the red face that they'll get, sometimes if they're not crying really loud, they'll actually be trembling and they're starving. Because remember, tiny little tummies need regular feeding. So some of the signs that you will see for hunger you'll see signs as well when the baby is full. So they'll stop sucking. They'll literally turn their face away from you and they will just literally shake their heads. It's like, yep, I've had enough. They'll start spitting out the milk potentially. And sometimes we call it their milk drunk where they just fall asleep. So it depends on the baby and what you will see as their cues for when they're hungry and their cues for when they are full. So when we are feeding, it's real. It's a beautiful time. You feel so nurturing. You're providing that environment for them. They're getting their food. They're very settled. It is, yes, good nutrition. And we know that we need to make sure that we have lots and lots of time allowed for feeding because it's not something that happens in five minutes. So you have to think about that when you're in the baby's room, that a lot of time, if you have a little infant, a lot of time is spent feeding them effectively. So good feeding, it supports good nutrition. And we know that that is because they have so much growth in the first 12 months after their birth. 
Now moving on to our toddler time. I loved this photo. I was like, yes, that is exactly what they look like and they love it. So feeding is a time to find out about those new tastes, new textures. We want to introduce them to lots of different foods. So in a childcare setting, they do have lots of different foods that they will try out. Some childcare centers have the most amazing cooks and chefs that do fabulous food for them. So you want to make sure that a child is moving on to be an independent feeder when they're ready. So when they can pick up individual objects with their thumb and their index finger, so using their pincher grasp, they're ready to try some new textures and give them different things to haul up to their mouths and give them a good chew and so on. Because so many things go straight into their mouths, we need to make sure that we have things of the right size and shape. We don't provide them with any choking hazards. So we cut up things like cherry tomatoes and grapes. We make sure that we are being responsive to the different types of foods. So toddlers will assert themselves a lot during meal times, And so that is when they will learn to say no in obvious ways and they will take on board that individual element of things they like and things they don't. So we want to really encourage them to have lots of efforts and lots of goes at trying out different foods. So you want to promote that idea of pleasure and success and don't make too many demands. So we don't leave them sitting at the table forever just because they haven't eaten everything on their plate and so on. So you'll find in a childcare setting there are some lovely ways that they help the children to finish whatever they need, have the right amount of food, have extras if they need to and so on. Children will only eat what they're hungry for. So you give them enough food and they will eat what they like and they'll eat as much as they need. It's not like they're going to be stuffing themselves. It doesn't happen with our little toddlers. So we have to just give them whatever they need at that point in time. So how do you make it easier? So when you're at home feeding toddlers, it can be a little bit of a nightmare. I find in a childcare setting, as long as you provide a range of food every day and that you are being regular with your food and your food is appropriate for the children, generally it will work. The bits that I see that are interesting and cause conflicts are when we make them sit down and wait for their food. So you want to have your routines really established where they sit at their little table, they've got their plates, they've got their cutlery, everything is ready for them and then we have wait times at a minimum. So if you are having some waiting, you know, it always going to happen where something's not quite ready and so on. Think about some singing, thinking about telling them a story, doing some finger rhymes and so on. Think about how you set that physical environment up so that it is successful for the children. And it's also easy to set up for you as the educator and to clean up because it's going to make a mess. So we need to make sure that you are setting all of those things up for success for yourself. So when it comes to nap times, so little tiny babies, they eat, they sleep, they poop, and that's about all they do. Then as we move into our baby babies, so once they get to be about three or four months old, they sleep often, but they sleep when they need to, and it's not always regular. So toddlers, they need lots of sleep. They are running around to meet their high energies and they'll literally just collapse at some point. We know that toddlers usually need 10 to 12 hours at night and one to two hours of naps during the day. And if they're just starting in childcare, they might need even longer naps because they get worn out. So we want to make sure that they're allowed to rest without being coerced and bribed into sleep. Caregivers generally in, in a childcare setting encourage the parents to supply pillows, blankets, stuffed animals, toys. Some centres have rules regarding those. So think about what is allowed and what you want to create to get that link between home and the setting at childcare. Some toddlers in particular, they have their blankies, they have their binkies, they have their toy that goes everywhere with them. And it starts to look very sad after a while. And so we want to make sure that we have the range that are necessary to have the child be able to sleep, but also meet all of our safety requirements. So 
The SIDS and Kids Safe Sleeping website has lots of really good information that might be useful for your website and also things to keep in mind when you are on PRAC. So always keep in mind we've got government guidelines, we've got a CEQA guidelines and you've got centre guidelines. So you want to make sure you are meeting all of those for your nap time. So I want you to think about what are some of the benefits of nap or quiet time for toddlers and preschool children. So think through why do we want the children to have that quiet time and how are we going to make sure that we build it into our day and think about the setup of the centre, the physical environment, the emotional environment and all those sorts of things. Now, our nappy changing. So this is one that Tracy found. I loved it. I included it as well. Changing a nappy is a lot like getting a present from your grandmother. You're not sure what you've got, but you're pretty sure you're not going to like it. So changing a nappy is always an adventure. And sometimes it's one you don't really want. So nappy changing is an essential element of every young child. So the younger they are, the more often you'll need their nappy changed. Some babies... They can stay in a dirty nappy for ages and they'll not give you any indication it is bothering them. Some of them, the minute that it moves into their nappy, they want to be changed and they'll cry and they'll get really unsettled. Sometimes their skin will start to hurt. So you want to make sure that you are in a process of constantly checking nappies. So some um, centres have particular times that you check nappies and change nappies. And some centres, it's a little bit looser about things. Most will have very set guidelines as to when and how. So the how we're going to do in tutorial and we're going to look at our guidelines that are from a CEQA and we're going to look at a couple of ones that are publicly available from various childcare centres. And nappy changing should be a learning experience, not learning experience for you, but a learning experience for the little baba. Because you've got all of the motor activities, they're kicking and moving around. You've got that talking that happens because it's just you and that child for a period of time. You've got all the social interactions with the gentle touching, the smiling and so on. And you've got the sensory experiences for the child, that feeling of being free and dry. And then we wrap them back up again. So you want to make sure that you are building on all of those experiences. So we've got nappies and then you start to move into the time where it becomes toilet training. So prior to the potty training, they usually, I, this statistic was huge, they've had their nappy changed about 6,000 times. Wowzers, that's a lot, isn't it? So then we move into toilet training. Now, toilet training needs to be coordinated between the childcare centre, the family, the caregiver. All of you need to talk and interact with one another. Different cultures have very different practices and beliefs around toilet training. So you'll need to talk to the caregivers and find out what they're doing at home. So you may find some caregivers do toilet training very, very early, like at one year old, and others, they're still in nappies past the age of three. So you want to work out what's going to be appropriate for the centre and for the cultural beliefs and practices of the caregivers. So toilet training, we essentially shouldn't begin if there's any other life changes, such as a new baby, a moving house or anything like that, because it can create a regression in some way. So most of our early year centres they follow the parent's lead in determining when to begin the toilet training. Now, we need to help our parents and caregivers to understand to dress the children in clothes that are easy to take on and off. I know when children arrive in overalls and they're not 100% toilet trained, you just kind of do a big sigh because you know you're going to have an accident that day. And so... We want to make sure that there's lots of extra clothes and we establish some good disinfecting practices and so on. So things that are, we know a child is ready. So we know that they're going to start to pull their pants down potentially. They'll be sitting on the toilet or potty with their pants on. Uh, they'll stay dry longer. They'll tell you that they need to go and um, go to the toilet. They'll have all different words for it as well. It's quite interesting. And 
what we know physiologically, girls will learn control earlier than boys. I thought it was an emotional development, but it's not. It's actually that girls have fewer muscles that are involved in their bladder and bowel control. Now, caregivers should expect uneven development. It's like they are dry for a while and then they'll have a, a week of accidents again and then they'll be back to it and so on. Now, there's a big difference between daytime toilet training and nighttime toilet training. So don't confuse the two. You're only worried about daytime toilet training. So you want to give recognition. You want to give lots of positive responses, lots of encouragement. But always remember that accidents are going to happen and they do start to get upset when they have accidents. So just reassure them that they'll be much better tomorrow and it's all okay and they'll just get changed and let them go through their processes and so on. So we want to just keep reassuring the children. So what I want you to have a think about is what does our early years learning framework say about our care routines? And what does our NQS say about our care routines? So your assignment asks you to describe the qualities of best practice for care routines in early childhood settings, birth to two years old and three to five. The early years frameworks based on those principles and practices of contemporary theories and research. Our NQS describes quality and in the tutorial, we're going to go through that in a little bit more. So if we're talking about the EYLF, we're talking about Quality Assurance Standard 1, Educational Program and Practices. Quality um, 2 is Children's Health and Safety, and that's where we have the sleep, rest, health hygiene and safe food. We're also looking at Standard 5 with our relationships with children and our collaborative our Standard 6, Collaborative Partnerships with Families and Communities. So all of those happen with our routines. So you want to make sure when you're thinking about how you write this up, that you include as many of those ideas as possible. So in our tutorial, we are going through nappy changing. So we are looking at how we change a nappy, what types of nappies there are available. We're looking at some nap time and how we soothe babies. We're then moving on to the idea of toileting for our slightly older children and our talking about feeding time with our babies and toddlers. So thank you very much. There are lots of readings in Blackboard for you for this week. Have a flick through and we'll be referring to some of those. Remember that all of these routines are the essential elements that you need to know and have really understood because once you get into that childcare setting, you're going to be doing them. So you want to spend a bit of time finding out what are the general rules and guidelines and then when you're in your center, know exactly what the center expects for nappy changing, know exactly what the toileting is, know exactly how the nap times run and understand how they're doing their feeding and meal times and all those sorts of things. Thanks everyone and I will see you all in the tutorial.